discussion today is political competition alongside dialogue. Is this a myth or reality for Uganda? To give you some context, political party dialogue in polarized societies is the best path to achieve inclusive solutions to institutional weakness or politics of identity. In the year 2010, the Interparty Organization for Dialogue, IPOD, was set up as a dialogue platform for all political parties represented in Uganda's parliament. Its formation was intended to enhance cooperation and collaboration across parties, and commitment was made towards putting Uganda first. This platform brings together political parties from both the ruling and opposition parties under one umbrella to ensure the growth of a vibrant, well-functioning, multi-party democracy in Uganda. One of the reasons IPOD was formed was to promote inter-party dialogue and cooperation as a means for dealing with political differences and managing conflict without resorting to undemocratic means, including violence. We can agree, however, that in the past 10 years of IPOD's existence in Uganda, the democratic space has shrunk, going from bad to worse every successive year. And this is what brings us to, to, to today's discussion on whether political dialogue can really thrive alongside political competition in Uganda. With me to discuss this are three gentlemen. And firstly, we have Mr. Fred Musisi, who is a playwright and a renowned pro-democracy activist in Uganda. Fred, you're most welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Liz. I'm very glad to be part of this uh, discussion this morning. Thank you, too. And secondly, we have Mr. Isero Abel. Abel is a political scientist, and you're most welcome to the show. Abel, can we see you? Yeah, thank you, Liz. Uh, um, uh, and happy new year to all the viewers. Uh, thirdly, we have a pan-Africanist and electoral democracy expert, Mr. Henry Muguzi. Henry, you're welcome to the show. Thank you, Liz. Happy New Year, viewers. Uh, always a pleasure to be here and talk about uh, a subject that is quite uh, passionate to all of us. So let's get right into the conversation. And I'm going to start with you, Fred. What do you think necessitated yes. iPod's existence in Uganda? Was it the right intervention at the time it was formed? Uh, thank you again. And um, Happy New Year, dear viewers. Well, as you did uh, mention in your opening remarks, uh, the objective uh, is well set. Uh, it's about cooperation to avoid uh, conflict after elections so that we can build our democracy as a country through dialogue as an option. Uh, but the question I think uh, is supposed to lead us into the direction whether uh, this objective is actually being pursued the right way. Um, when we look at what is happening, uh, um, I believe that as Ugandans, all of us, we want a very stable country, for those in the politics and those outside the politics. We don't want to be uh, destabilized in any way. But if there is such a, a name, a platform, an iPod, and then we hear some political parties, uh, entities that we believe understand this concept better than other Ugandans, but some of them are actually resisting to be part of it, then we have to rethink this question. What actually necessitated the formation of this iPod? Is, was it the right intervention? Uh, is it doing, being done for the right reasons? Uh, what do we see on the ground? Um, as a playwright, it is very important always to look at the characters uh, involved in any, any scenario. What is the behavior of the main characters in this scenario? Are they actually uh, uh, leading us into that objective that is on paper? Because it's one thing having an objective on paper, but it's another actually pursuing it. But from what we can see, it seems that there is, um, that there is a bit of a problem. And that's why uh, iPod is facing this kind of resistance from some of the parties. So um, uh, 
I don't know whether this is the right moment for me to look at this because I mentioned characters and I like to talk about parties as characters. Okay, in this whole discussion, I want to look at as the uh, the characters. Um, we will call them uh, antagonists and protagonists uh, in the in the writing uh, profession. Uh, when you look at the modern democracy, uh, in modern representative democracy, political parties play a very important role, which includes uh, getting information, knowledge, and demands from. Um, Fred. We seem to be having issues with our connectivity. Um, Henry, I'm going to. Henry, can you hear me? Yes, I am here, Lisa, as you can see. Yes. And uh, I want to pick it up from where Fred left it. I think yeah, the yeah. idea of uh, uh, iPod starts uh, in Uganda in earnest in 2011. And we do know that uh, it was at the invitation of the Super Prime Minister, Red Honorable John Patrick Amama Mbabazi. When they set up, when NIMD comes to Uganda in 2011, and 12 rather, and sets up iPod, it was against a backdrop of an election of the general election of 2011, which was described in a word as violent. Now, so because of that background, it became apparent to try and work towards building dialogue. Now, at the time, uh, the idea of having dialogue coexisting alongside uh, political competition sounded new, but also very uh, 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 attractive. And so it starts up, first of all, uh, it, it sets up, first of all, to, 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 to foster this dialogue, dialogue that perhaps would not have been achieved on the floor of parliament, but dialogue that could be achieved outside parliament with the many protagonists, as Fred chose to call them, the political parties that had participated in the elections, but also had representatives in, in, in Parliament, working along and trying to learn. It was a learning, trying to learn how do we get to dialogue with our former our enemies, the enemy people we were with in 2011, the people that had uh, the, the uh, situation where the party in power, you remember the Kakoza Mutale thing, the party in power had made sure that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the opposition uh, candidate at the time, who was Kiza Besije, uh, at the level of presidents, but also the other political parties, had faced such a rough time that it was difficult to forgive and also forget. So it became quite uh, interesting and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and palatable. To, to have iPod uh, tested and tried and to see how it would help us to paper over cracks, but also to kind of heal the wounds that had been opened during that violent general election of 2011. Thank you. Lisa. Thank you, Henry. Yes, thank you for that. Um, Fred, before you had issues with your internet you are putting a point across you can pick up from where you we left yeah now thank you liz and thank you henry uh for those uh, remarks yes I, w I was saying that um, looking at the political parties we need to understand uh, the nature of these characters uh, are they actually uh, able uh, to get into this space and actually dialogue are they built for that? Because if these political parties are actually are doing the things that I was mentioning, things like uh, reaching out to society, uh, getting people's views, getting people's demands, and turn them into policies, and then push these policies as their uh, basics. Uh, they depend on these policies. 
For example, if they are, uh, they are dealing with the environment, for them, they are interested in that. What do people say about the environment in this country? And they form policies about that. Then that means when they go into this space, they have an agenda, a specific agenda to look out for, something to speak about. But what is the agenda? What are the ideals of our characters in this scenario? Okay? If we, move, we remove these names, eh? if we remove a name like uh, NRM, if we remove a name like DP, like NOOP, what, does, what remains? What is there that can differentiate these political parties that can help them sit around a table to discuss these divergent views? So that was, that's what the point I was trying to make, that it's important to understand the characters before we even go uh, to the dialogue table. Mm. Thank you, Fred, and thank you for explaining to us in that manner. I've never had <laughs> it explained that way. And that brings me to the next question. I'll keep up with you, Fred. Do you think that political dialogue can thrive alongside political competition based on Uganda's context in the same way that you have explained it, given those different characters? Is it possible? Is this achievable? Yeah, I would say yes and no. Um, uh, I would say yes, um, as a, a progressive uh, Ugandan, I believe this is possible. Uh, but it has to, uh, something has to be done about the characters, first and foremost. We cannot uh, uh, put the cart before the horse and expect to move forward. There will be a problem. We will get stuck before we start the journey. Uh, first of all, Let's look at the democratic processes within these political parties. How do the leaders get into these positions? How, if we are to find uh, a democracy gauge, uh, what would be the scores at political party level? Because that determines, you don't expect a leader who has assumed the office uh, through um, non-democratic processes or um, uh, democracy that is questionable to get to that level and actually practice democracy at the national level. Mm. They will have a problem because people hardly change, especially when it comes to power. We all know that power corrupts and the absolute power corrupts absolutely. So this that's one reason. When you look at the background of our political parties, after every election in a political party, a new faction comes up. There are disagreements. No, these elections we are rigged. No, that is not our president. No, we, we for, for me, I belong to party so and so. My president is so and so. We know this huh? in different parties. Now, these are the parties that we expect to get into the iPod space and actually exercise democracy and actually uh, discuss uh, matters of national importance. I think there is a problem at that level. We need to get back to the basics and get some of these uh, issues ironed out, okay? Then we can, uh, we can begin to look at uh, dialogue. But also the other point I want to make, uh, why I said no, because dialogue is delicate in our situation eh? it's very hard to have a constructive dialogue because dialogue in its center is very delicate to the extent that each and every word you before and during the process matters because the words we use describe us they describe our characters they tell the people who we are. What is, is it that we are thinking? But sometimes the words that our leaders utter are, are, are not, they cannot facilitate dialogue. By the time people get into the room, they're already in a fighting mood. They want to strangle each other. So dialogue becomes uh, very, very tricky. So I think it's a yes and no, but like Henry said, uh, this is something that is worthy uh, 
uh, attempting, we will need to go into it. We have no option because the option is actually very, very expensive. We can't afford it as a country. Wow, thank you so much, Fred. And you mentioned something very important that I've picked. Um, Fred says dialogue is very fragile, it's very delicate. And that moves me to my next question. Abel, I'm going to bring you in. What are the minimum standards that must be in place for dialogue to happen in, in any nation? And in Uganda, do you think we have those minimum standards? Fred mentions that we have our leaders sometimes say some words that leave us wondering. We have had the president himself say he's going to crush the opposition. With those kinds of words, do you think dialogue can happen in Uganda? Do we have the standards in place? Thank you, Liz. Uh, first of all, before I respond to that, I want to uh, ask all to appreciate that uh, uh, political parties as, uh, as organizations that are the heart of democracy, we do know that they always compete for political power. And through their competition, there are always issues that arise and create a lot of differences through those competition. We have seen in various countries, also in Uganda and other parts of Africa, where we have seen if, whenever political parties are competing for power, we see a lot of things from sectorization, militarization, violence, and commercialization of politics. And we find that most of the political parties don't, that don't have access to some of these weapons are at a disadvantage. So you find that they, 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 they leave the electoral process when they are not satisfied with how the process has been organized and managed. So that already creates an environment where there's a political party and others which have issues that need to be addressed. And one way of addressing those issues is through having a political dialogue. But now, coming back to your question, the minimum standards which we need to have in place to ensure that we can have a progressive political dialogue, one of it is having political tolerance. But you find that in most countries, once political parties and candidates have finished an electoral process, they don't need to talk to even each other. All the, cons all the concerns, they, they, they always concentrate on now blackmailing, abusing, and attacking each other instead of them coming together in a round table and agreeing on some of the differences, they have the continue, you find that uh, others are calling others dictators, some are being called big, some are being, so they label them in various ways. So you find that they don't tolerate each other. So it's very difficult for you to bring people on board who first of all don't espouse the spirit of political tolerance. So we need first of all have leaders and political parties that tolerate each other. If we have finished an election and there are issues, or differences that we have seen through that electoral process when we are competing for political power. Can we as political parties and leaders tolerate each other and say, okay, we have this, how can we come together and address this? But most of our political parties and candidates front their interest first, instead of fronting the national interest that can help the country grow. Because when we are building a nation, we need to put our personal differences aside. We need to first see what is that thing that benefits the country as a whole. So collectively, let's put our efforts first to the interest of the nation before we front our own interests. So the only problem in Africa we have is that political parties and candidates have really failed to appreciate that they can sit in the same round table with those people who have offended them from the process of competing for power. So they feel like we cannot share the same table with someone who has arrested us, tortured us, killed some of our supporters, and they are even not giving us space to organize, mobilize. So how do you expect us to go and dialogue with such people? So that's one of the issues that is affecting uh, effective dialogue in Africa and Uganda in general. Yes, thank you, Abel. So you mentioned that tolerance is one of the main aspects for dialogue to happen. But looking at Uganda, it's very obvious that political parties are not tolerant to one another. There's no respect. There's a lot of bitterness. Even in the opposition itself, opposition parties are do not have respect for other opposition parties, and they're bitter towards each other. Does that mean that we will never have effective dialogue based on the current situation? I will go back to what uh, one of our panelists, Fred, talked about. is the character of the leaders we have in place. 
if you have leaders who are bitter and do not tolerate others, then you cannot have an effective dialogue because it goes back to the character of the leaders in place and the political parties in place. Do they really represent the interests of Ugandans? or they represent their own interests. So if you front your interests first, that means you will not need to negotiate with anyone concerning issues that are affecting Iran at large. So you will look at things from a personal level and you become emotive because you have not achieved your personal goals. So the character of the leaders we have in place can determine whether we can have a progressive political dialogue or not. So it's until we start looking at leaders from also their own personal characters. Because if you have a leader that has a weird personal character, don't expect that leader to come in place and say, I can sit with other leaders and dialogue in the same, same table so that we can see that we can build a nation that represents Ugandans at large, not a nation that represents a few minority or ethnic group and leaves the rest of Ugandans outside. And this will always cause a lot of grievances and we cannot develop as a country. Mm. Thank you, Abel, for that. And it's interesting that Fred brought up that issue of character and personal traits of the leaders that we have in place. Um, do you think dialogue is, is part of our DNA as Africans, Henry? Because this is not just a case of Uganda. We see a lot of conflict on the continent. We saw what happened during the Toji Kwataku incidents in parliament. We saw how our honorable members of parliament were tussling it out over there because they failed to talk, they failed to... And we have seen such incidences across Africa in different parliaments. People end up having to blow punches here and there because they have failed to talk. Do you think it's part of our DNA as Africans? Because we see in Europe, they sit civically and discuss, but we can't, we have failed to see that in Africa. What do you think about this, Henry? Thank you, Lisa. Of course, quite an interesting discussion. Now, when you look at African societies from the uh, uh, olden times, we used to live under kings and, uh, and, uh, and feudal lords. At that time, we would get orders. It would be difficult for you to go and dialogue with a king over what? So when the colonial, uh, uh, colonialists came here, it was the same story them dictating us and giving us directions. It's either their way or the highway. And if you don't go the, the go do it their way, then you 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 receive punishment. Now the leaders that took over from the colonial apparatus, I think continued with the, the trajectory um, of the of, 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 of the colonialists. But also if you look at our society Henry, generally your, your uh, internet is a bit shaky. Okay. Yeah. Can you, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you, uh, Lisa, and uh, um, I think I can proceed. So, um, yes, you can proceed. So if, if you look at our societies, even our own homes, the man and the woman in the home, I don't think many of them dialogue. If you look at the, 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 uh, the parent-child relationship, it is not one of dialogue. In many of our organizations, you have this big boss. So this whole thing carries over from the political parties we have. So the political parties we have are political parties that have strong leaders, strong men, men who have formed these political parties, men who are calling the shots, and many of these men who think and perceive of themselves as being larger than the party. If you start with the party in power, I think Mr. M7 is larger than the party. Now, you have a man who has been so uh, clear from the onset. He has told you in 2016 that come 2021, there will be no opposition political party standing. You clearly know that his interest is in ensuring that the regime survival enterprise continues to thrive and blossom. And therefore, when you talk about dialogue, political dialogue, dialogue with who? Now, how do you dialogue with a man who thinks he's at this level and you at this lower level? I think for dialogue to take place and take root, uh, it has to be that all of you accept and come to the same level, same table, and that you are all equal, and then you can dialogue. Now, that this is all part of the DNA we are living with. In the schools we go to, 
Have you ever found the students dialoguing with the headmaster or head teacher? This does not happen. Okay, so we are a society that is used to taking orders from above. Now, the man who, who you, you, when you have a situation where you have an imperious president that wants to control and 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 manipulate and 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 drain over everything. So you 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 talk about dialogue with who? So these are some of the things I think we are experiencing, but. When you trace it, like you rightly said, uh, it traces its its roots from the very culture of the African society, where we are used uh, to a situation where there are uh, there are subjects and leaders, and that orders come from one direction, from the one on top to the one down, and that there is you who is down. You all you have to do is to obey orders. It's either you obey orders or receive punishment. So this is the kind of society that we live in that seems to have mitigated, militated against the idea of political dialogue existing alongside uh, political competition existing in, 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 in Uganda. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Henry, for breaking that down for us. Um, Abel, I hope you can hear me. Um, in Uganda, do we have a past record of using dialogue? And if so, has it yielded any gain? Has it worked if we have? Yeah, Uganda has had uh, a history of dialogue from the past. First of all, Uganda as a nation, before we became a nation, uh, we were under colonial rule by the British. And before we, 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 we gained independence, we gained this independence through having diplomatic negotiations. We had uh, representatives from uh, uh, political parties, kingdoms, local districts, and also other representatives who went and sat uh, at Lancaster in the United Kingdom to negotiate on how Uganda should be governed. So we did not fight uh, like other African countries that had to fight and uh, kill each other. For us, we, we negotiated our country through dialogue. So uh that's one of the achievements which i can say but uh whether it work onwards it's another thing because after the negotiations and gaining independence as a country the leaders that were supposed now to govern uganda as a nation regardless of the ethnic backgrounds that they were in failed to look at uganda as a country by fronting the national interest first we had issues whereby now we started looking at each other in our ethnic groupings and we had a lot of crises well, from 1966. We saw the crisis of 1966, which emerged after there were issues between the Buganda Kingdom and uh, the Uganda People's Congress of Milton, Apollo Milton Obote. They failed to agree on certain issues. So the dialogue that about Uganda failed during that time, and that escalated. And we saw the 1971 coup, whereby Amin came and toppled off his, uh, his leader, that was uh, Apollo Milton Obote. But we also had dialogue, which was uh, uh, around 1979, that was uh, in uh, Arusha, uh, in Moshi, in, uh, in, in Tanzania, where Ugandans who were, in the, who were in exile had to plan on how do we go back and fix our country, which was, which they claim was being mismanaged by Idi Amin, who, who had come in through a military coup. So some of these leaders had to dialogue, they had to agree on how to go back to the country. And one of the things they espoused was that we need to go back and govern our country democratically. All the consensus we do make, they should be democratically agreed upon. So, But still after that, we saw they came into place, they held elections, 1980 elections. The elections were not... Uh, held in a free and fair manner. That later saw Museven go to the bush to fight the outcomes of the election. So to me, dialogue in Uganda has not achieved much. <laughs>